Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. You know, it was Rahm Emanuel who was once famous for saying, you never let a serious crisis go to waste. What a lot of people fail to remember is the second sentence in that quote, which was, and what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. Well, when it comes to gun control, that is exactly what happens. Because despite the fact that we know that almost 90% of all gun crimes in the United States are committed by those who are unlawfully possessing their firearm at the time the crime is committed, 100% of gun control regulations is instead designed to regulate you, the lawful and responsible gun owner. It has us begging the question, do they actually want to solve the problem or is it a perfect wedge issue until they get to their ultimate goal, which is complete disarmament? of the American citizens. Now, you think this might be hyperbole? You think this might be crazy conspiracy theory? Well, let's take a look at another example, because here at Washington Gun Law, we want to be really, really careful about not telling you folks how to think, but just giving you all the stuff to think about. We have another huge problem in this country. It's with suicide amongst our veterans. And I think we need to take a look at how the United States government has responded to that, how the Department of Defense has responded to that, and what that tells us about how they're trying to deal with other issues involving firearms and whether or not they actually want to solve these problems or do they want to use it as a wedge issue to make sure that they can disarm all of us. So today, we're going to spend a few controversial minutes and talk about when a woke military wants to disarm its own soldiers. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about today is a bit of a controversial issue, and I want to start off with a couple of caveats, okay? Caveat number one, I did not serve in the United States military. I've made that very clear to my viewers. I have tremendous respect for everybody who did. The only comment I ever have about anybody who served in the United States military is, God bless you, and thank you for your service to our country. Number two, the topic that we're going to be talking about today the alarming high rate of suicide amongst veterans, either currently in the military or those transitioning out, or some that have been transitioned out and into civilian life for a number of years. But the horrible number of suicides that we see amongst veterans as compared to other demographic groups, because it is alarming. It is something that all of us should be concerned about. It is a dilemma that we should all be looking for solutions for. Number three. I in no way am an expert on what is the cause of suicide amongst veterans. And candidly, no matter how much studying I could even undertake, I would never be an expert compared to those of you who actually served in the United States military. And so I am really asking for some of my veterans out there who are viewers of this channel to chime in on the discussions, chime in on the comment section here, and let me hear your thoughts because I think your thoughts and insights are gonna be incredibly valuable to this. Why are we talking about all this? Well, we're talking about it because the Department of Defense recently spent a lot of your taxpayer dollars to, uh, to fund a study by the Suicide Prevention and Response Independent Review Committee. And last week, they released their huge study through the Department of Defense. When I say huge study, listen, they had 10 experts that were retained for this study. They spent $2.4 million of your hard taxpayer earned money to conduct this study and came out with a study which was entitled Preventing Suicide in the U.S. Military Recommendations from the Suicide Prevention and Response Independent Review Committee. Real fancy title. However, one would think that, hey, this is going to be wonderful news. We're going to finally get to the root problem. Why is it that our young men and women are doing this to themselves? What is going on that is creating this horrific situation, okay? And come to find out that rather than focusing on the root causes, what is driving young people or people of any age to do this, but why at an alarmingly higher rate amongst veterans? Uh, instead, over 115 pages, now the, the study is 115 pages, there is one word that was used 132 times, and that is the word firearm. Because it appears that what the United States government, the Department of Defense, is doing with their new progressive policy is they are using this as that serious crisis that they do not want to let go to waste. And they are literally using this as an opportunity to disarm their own soldiers. I know that sounds weird. We would equip these young people with the finest, most lethal equipment that ever known to man, create the absolute greatest armed force to ever exist on this planet, 
and yet then want to disarm them otherwise, okay? Don't believe me, okay? Well, let's take a look at what the recommendations from the committee suggest because they had a laundry list of recommendations and rather than rooting out what the root cause, why are these veterans doing this to themselves? What is causing this? Well, here's a list of some of their recommendations. Substitute real due process with procedural due process regarding the collection and recording of information relating to the lawful acquisition, possession, ownership, carrying, or other use of privately owned firearms or weapons by military personnel and civilian employees of the Department of Defense. Have lawyers figure out a way to bypass current legal protections so that information about firearm acquisition, possession, ownership, carrying, or other use of privately owned firearms or weapons by military personnel and civilian employees of the Department of Defense can be legally collected by program evaluators. That's right. The recommendation is get a bunch of lawyers together and figure out how we can circumvent the constitutional protections to make sure we can gather information. But it doesn't stop there. There is a lot more to it, including mandate safety training for privately owned firearms with five-year renewals. And so that means you could theoretically have a group of military individuals who are highly trained in every platform of firearm ever known to man and highly proficient in each and every one of those, and yet they would still need to take private training to make sure that they're safe at home. They can survive on the battlefield, but can they survive in their living room? There's more. Implement a seven-day waiting period for any firearm purchased on Department of Defense property. Develop a national database for recording serial numbers of firearms purchased on DOD property. Presumably that information will still be available and accessible by a changeable list of authorized persons yet to be determined even after the service member has retired. That's right. They literally have a recommendation to willfully violate the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986, one of the largest pieces of federal gun legislation to come along in many, many, many years. And that is one of their recommendations. But they do not stop there. They continue with these. Implement a four-day waiting period for ammunition purchases on Department of Defense property to follow purchases and receipt of firearms purchased on Department of Defense property. On Department of Defense property, raise the minimum age for purchasing firearms and ammunition to 25 years. So you could be enlisted into the United States Armed Forces at age 18, given an incredibly highly deadly and dangerous weapon, but be trained to use it exactly the way you're supposed to. But you're not allowed to purchase ammunition or a firearm on the base for another seven years. And they don't stop there because the list also includes mandatory gun locks, notifying command of purchases, mandatory registration, living quarter restrictions, and a total ban for visitors to DOD property. Now, you're sitting there going, well, they had to focus on something more than just the guns. Oh, yeah, they did. They focused on some other inanimate objects because this is also part of DOD's recommendations. The committee also recommends retrofitting shower and window curtain rods and closet rods that can break away with excessive load. Recommend that banning discounts on and promotion of energy drinks. So once again, it's the inanimate objects. It's all about the firearms and then it's the curtain rods, the shower curtains, and the energy drinks, okay? And nowhere in this report, though, do they really want to talk about finding out what is happening from a psychological standpoint that drives these people to wanting to do this to themselves. Is that not the problem? If somebody is hell-bent on killing themselves, whether they can legally access a firearm or not, they can accomplish that task. They do recommend, however, that those who are employed at the military exchange suddenly become pocket psychiatrists and be able to spot the difference between a person purchasing a firearm for a legitimate purpose and a person being able to purchase a firearm for a harmful purpose. DOD's recommendations specifically stated, require military exchange personnel to complete skills-based training designed to recognize indicators of elevated emotional distress and effective methods for interacting with and responding to acutely distressed customers. But in nowhere in this entire report do they ever want to actually take a look at the root cause of the problem. It's as if they believe that these inanimate objects are possessing these individuals to take their own lives. And they are never once wanting to peel back all the layers of the onion to get to the root cause of the problem. It's tantamount to what's happening in other forms of gun control. 
Every time we have a horrific incident involving some madman doing something crazy with a gun that they unlawfully obtained, the legislature's reaction is to punish every lawful and responsible gun owner. Now, I spent many years as a DUI attorney, and I can tell you that I have represented cases where a person got drunk, got into a car, and slaughtered a family. And as horrible as it is, and as unjust as it was to the victim's family, at no point do we actually have state legislators start talking about banning cars or banning the use of alcohol. And perhaps the military, from what I hear, should do its own self-reflection about what are they doing to perhaps contribute to the problem. Does this new woke and progressive agenda set up for further pitfalls and further failure points along the way for up-and-coming soldiers who, but otherwise, for their talents on or off the battlefield would be fine, but they don't march to the correct drummer. They don't have the correct political view. They don't say the politically correct things because that is a whole new level of failure that is in the military that did not previously exist. Recognizing also that the military is not the most attractive option in the United States, we know that several branches of the service have lowered their standards. These lowering of academic standards, do, does that come with a lowering of emotional maturity? Does that come with a lowering of emotional regularity? Does that just come with, candidly, a lower caliber of individual? I don't know the answers to this because, again, I'm not suggesting that I know the answers. I'm suggesting that these are questions that we should all be asking. But the biggest question, the biggest question that should have been asked and answered in this 115 page, $2.4 million study is, why the hell is this happening to these people? And they never once tried to do that. Instead, they tried to figure out, how can we disarm our own military members? Listen, you may have more questions about this particular study or anything else related to what's left of our Second Amendment rights. Again, I encourage all of you, especially my veterans out there, Please respond down below in the comment section. Tell me what you think. Share with us your knowledge and insight. In the meantime, if you guys have any other questions, remember you can always contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now in the meantime, let's remember part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.